series of programs from the Dell Home Service League. We're pleased that everybody can join. It looks like we've got a lot of guests in the um, participants. So thank you for coming out today. Uh, we have one more program like this scheduled next Thursday, the 22nd. We're gonna be visiting with Akira Sataki, um, another um, good friend of the Dell Home. And uh, we hope you'll be able to join us then. Uh, throughout today's program, if you've got questions, you can put them in the chat. And if they're pertinent to the topic right then, we'll squeeze them in or we may hold them towards the end. Um, and depending on how many people, we may just let everybody unmute and pose their questions as we have an opportunity. Um, probably by this time tomorrow, we'll have a recording of this posted on the, our YouTube site. You can go to YouTube and just search for Dell Home Service League and it'll be posted there. And I'll put a link in the chat in just a minute or two that also has a link that you can use to find, go to our website related to Potter's Market, but we've also got a uh, information in there about upcoming programs, links to videos, information on joining the Dell Home and ways to donate to support additional programming like this. So again, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Susie to introduce our speakers today. And uh, thank you for being here. Good morning, everybody. We're delighted you're with us. And this is a real treat for us to have Carol Gentithis and Fred Johnson working with the Dell Home and gonna give us a program I'm going to give you just a very short background uh, on Carol and Fred because they come from not traditional ceramic backgrounds. Carol, who's from Ohio, was actually an English literature major at Duke, which has, as we know, nothing to do with ceramics. And then she worked in DC, but she finally, I guess I'd have to say Carol wised up, realized that her real interest was in arts and went to Alfred in ceramics, and I believe that's where you met Fred, whose background was as a chef, which is good for his plates. And also he uh, built houses. So they come from really different backgrounds than your average uh, potter, but we're delighted to have them with us. We have a few questions we're gonna pose, but mostly we're just gonna let them chat. Carol, I'd like to start with you and ask you just a couple of quick questions. Uh, everybody wants to know about the pandemic. Has it been good for your business? Has it been bad for your business? What are the different challenges that you've seen? Are you doing more online? Is it what you expected? Is it not what you expected? It's all yours, Carol. Okay. Um, well, can we, so I can, I don't know. Oh, I just wanted to know Sorry. where I fit in okay. there. We, yeah, we can make our can yeah. blow this thing up. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's okay. It's fine where it is. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I guess the it did throw us for a loop because it came on when it came on. You kind of couldn't figure out what was happening, and then when everything had to shut down, that's when we realized, okay, this this is gonna be hard to conduct business when you can't be open. Uh, so we had already set up a website and started uh, putting things online on, on the shop, and that helped a lot. But we, but as as the uh, COVID started to loosen up a little bit, people could go out if they wore their masks and all that. Then we we noticed people were coming in, and we we didn't close completely. We would go by appointment only or. If people were driving by and they, you know, would call or they say, hey, can I come in? And it's like, sure, you know, but we, so it didn't hurt us that much, really. Um, and we're still like still tweaking things, but uh, like this weekend, we're going to have a spring kiln opening. Uh, a lot of Seagrove potters are participating and each, each of us will have um, new work at our studios. So we're hoping a lot of people come out for that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been not, not so bad for us. Would you say, Fred, or? No, I did, um, I did more trout fishing uh, this year <laughs> than I have since I was in oh, my yeah, uh, 20s. So uh, it's like, 
nature is, and both of both of both of us really, uh, particularly in the beginning of the pandemic, where everybody was just really isolated. Carol and I both spent a lot of time out in the woods and on the lake, and um, so you know. The, the sound of water, the sound of birds, all of that. It's very, uh, I don't know, it's soothing, you know, especially when things are so crazy and nutty. It was just a really, I, you know, I just, I made it a point, just like brushing your teeth or something to uh, go trout fishing. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you can see some of my, I started tying my own flies. So this is a piece of chicken feather and a little bit of hair fur. But uh, anyway. Well, Fred, were you doing a lot more, I, I understand, on Instagram? Um, I've, I've had a pretty strong presence on Instagram for the last few years. So um, maybe I have, I, don't know, I have about maybe 35, 3,600 followers. Uh, and it's, you know, I don't just post just the pottery. I, I post um, I post some of our outings when we're out in nature, some of our, um, the things that we're influenced by, the things we like to look at. Um, I mean, that's the one thing we usually spend a lot of time in museums. Um, but this year with the pandemic, we didn't get it. We couldn't do that. So, um, we just retreated to nature. Uh, and we have a, you know, we have a good library. We have a good art library, uh, but, you know, you always want new things to look at. And uh, so I, we, we miss the music, being able to go to the museums. Carol, did you do much on Instagram as well? No, I, I leave that up to Fred. I, I handled more of the website and the online, you know, posting things on, on our website. And then he takes care of the Instagram. It's kind of, uh, and, and then he also sends it off to Facebook too. So we get double exposure. Did you feel, Fred, have you dealt with Etsy? Because many people I know use them. Yes. Um, we, we didn't really get involved in that. Honestly, like the, well, well, whole, yeah. the, whole, the whole online thing for us, Carol was, she's like the person that does the packing. So she, Honestly, she just didn't like it. You know, well, she doesn't like having to, man it's like having another job, really. Yeah. And so, I mean, we did it initially because you're not open to the public. But once we were able to open our doors again, um, you know, I guess it's, you know, and you get a certain age in life, um, you know, we've paid off all our properties. We don't have the pressure that we used to, used to have economically. So we're able to, you know, do more of what we want to do and at our age we're we're more about doing what we want to do and um so uh, yeah, and i was going to say with our website we have we have an online shop so we didn't have to go to etsy people could just go directly to our website mm -hmm. and i like that better you don't have to deal with you know other parties it's just go directly to our website do, do you find that um the, the customers that you're getting online, you know, is a different group of customers than what you've usually worked with or more the same? Uh, more, it it seemed room? like it was like a lot of them I knew, like they purchased things and I'd recognize their name and say, hey, how are you doing? You know. But, but then there were people- uh, the People I that were coming in were different. I sold, I sold things to other artists, uh, people from all different parts of the country when we were when we first had when we really leaned into the online store a little bit more because we we hadn't populated it uh, with everything so but no a lot of people that followed me on Instagram um, would just you know direct message me and uh, or they'd go to the or they'd go to the website and so <clears throat> sometimes it's other artists you know well, this might be a good place for you to each just talk about your body of work a little bit, what your, you know, the different types of things you're working on and particularly anything, you know, any new stuff, anything that you've changed to. Um, but for, for those that aren't as familiar with your work, why don't we do a little overview of, of what you both produce? Okay. Carol, um, you go first. All right, I'll start. Uh, well, 
one of the main things that I work with are the decals. So um, I have some samples here of what it looks like on a piece. I didn't, I don't have my animals right in front of me. Usually I, I use them on my animals, but these uh, decals that I'm gonna show you right now are on pieces that thread through. And then I uh, went back and decorated and then refired. So here's the first one. This is an old uh, piece that, it's a tea bowl. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So that's the, um, it's a bird with, okay. So what, what's going on is I take, and I'm gonna show you the decal. I'll take like an image of a butterfly. This is the decal. Uh, wait, look oh, at that, here we go. It's hard to, okay, see that butterfly, the, yeah. the blue one. I take that, cut it up and then make it into this bird over here. And that's how I make all my images. I just use regular images and then cut them up to make other images. And it's sort of like working in a collage style. Um, these decals are made out of glazed material. So they're fired onto the surface and they're permanent. And, um, and there's different kinds. These are more of a commercial kind that you would see on um, China patterns. And then I have some that I have made, uh, custom made. Let me show you some other ones here. Let's see. Like, and, well, what's interesting also, like this one, okay, I've been shown that. That one was taken from a, more of a tropical, that's an anteater. Uh, <laughs> But it's, it was taken from a tropical pattern. So I would cut up this flower and then create that kind of imagery, uh, also using, combining it with odd combinations. So you see, I would combine it with decals from this to create these animals. And uh, I think I'm making, I think it's kind of clear, yeah. Yeah, and then I love also decorating on Fred's surfaces that, again, he made this one, but then he had, he wood fires and salt glazes. So then I'll take something like that and, and use my custom made decals. Um, these are the, my favorite writers. There's Mark Twain and put them on his back on his, on the background of his wood fire surface. And then they come out more mysterious and a little bit more, I don't know. Um, more of a storytelling uh, situation. There's Shakespeare. So in that case, it's already been fired in the wood kiln and then uh -huh. you apply these and do a second firing. I do a second firing, a, a, a yeah. A low fire. Um, a low fire, uh-huh. And they, um, yeah, as I said, they're all made out of a glazed material. And then you, these can also be, people always ask, well, can you put them in the dishwasher or can you wash them? It's like, yes, they can take, extreme temperatures, uh, microwave. Is there an additional, like a clear glaze over? No, these work, on, the principle on these is they go on top of a glaze. You can put them on a, you know, a bisque ware, but they won't come out as well. They'll, they'll disappear. But uh, yeah, so you, you put them, they have to be on, a, they're better on a glaze surface. There's one, like, here's an example, one where I put it on a surface that's not quite as, glaze that and what I do is I work off of Fred's glaze surface like so like I won't glaze it yeah. completely I'll leave little spots like this is just raw so it's like a random glazing so she takes advantage of that randomness to exploit her her images yeah and we do this on large scale pieces too so the idea of having this glaze consistent all over the pot is it something that we we generally try to make it where we have this yeah. piece, uh, bare spot? So that's just the salt glaze and the wood ash that creates this brown. And then this glaze is made from a uh, burnt rice husk ash. So it looks Great. like this stuff right here, ooh, this stuff that you see in this bowl, this is the husk, the burnt husk from uh, a rice, a, you know, just like a, a, a piece of corn, uh, a piece of rice has a husk around it. So this stuff is the 
burnt husk. Now what it's doing, it's pulling milky, the rice is pulling milky white silica out of the soil as it's growing. So then in the fiber of the plant exist the milky white silica. So when you burn the plant and you get rid of the organics, now you just have in the ash, this milky white silica. And that's more than 60 parts of, the, of this glaze. So the glaze goes on black, uh, but it comes out white. So all, all plants do this. I mean, all glaze comes from the soil. It's, it's a mineral or an element or an oxide. So when, when grass is growing, when any tree grows, it's pulling this, these nutrients up out of the soil. And those nutrients are glaze material. And I took a winter survival course once and they taught us to, uh, like if this is a tree that you would peel the bark back and you don't eat the bark, but you eat the layer between the wood and the bark. It's called the, cam the cambium layer. And it's the highest mineral content in wood. So I mean, this is kind of what beaver are after. And uh, of course they're eating all the bark, but um, if you burn wood that doesn't have bark on it in a wood kiln, you don't really get the same kind of mineral concentration that you would if you used uh, bark wood. So each tree, like a pine is, a pine tree is sort of green and an oak tree is more brown ash and fruit woods can be kind of a yellow ash. So through experimentation, you're able to, you know, play with these ash compositions in different, different kinds of ways. It's, it's interesting for your collaborative works, do you get together and plan those out in advance? Or Fred, you throw something and Carol, you get inspired to say, what can I do with this? Well, how, how many years did it take us oh, to yeah. come to the way this? It, the way, it, like in the beginning, Carol would say, oh, I want to collaborate. And I'm like, I don't know how to collaborate with you. I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> we have so then, style. so then I would have these pots that I didn't really like, you know, they were, they just didn't have, um, they didn't have it, you know, so they were sort of, uh, I had nothing to lose. So I told Carol, I was like, well, why don't you just, you know, decal this pot, do whatever you want. And she's like, well, what do you want me to do? I said, I don't, I don't care what you do. You just do whatever you feel like you want to do. I'm, uh, I'm over that pot. So, uh, she took advantage of these drips and she made this like really long, long legged, almost like a circus character, but it was because the, the pot had these long drips on it. So I was like, man, that is so cool. So then I gave her some more of my rejects and she, she won them back. So then I thought I should give her a really good pot, you know? So then I started giving her good pots and she <laughs> made them even better, you know? So, and I think, uh, clients liked it as well because it was a collaboration and then so when I'm I mean the only planning we do is like I mentioned before where I would make the glaze um, you know the sort of randomness and try to get some unglazed areas and and try to get some long drips and the sort of irregularity that I know that you know she's going to be able to exploit that and work off of it so that's really, you know, the only planning that I do on my end. And then, you know, when Carol takes it, she just works her mojo on it until she gets it the way she wants it. Yeah, I like the spontaneity of it, not really knowing what I'm going to do. Yeah, it's, it's more fun that way than planning. Yeah, if everything's planned, I'm, we don't like, even when we travel, we don't like to do a lot of planning. We like, I mean, you have to plan to a certain degree, but... Um, we like, you know, the half happens, ha how do you say? happenstance. Yeah. Um, just let things unfold sometimes and, and just, I don't know, it's more interesting. Um, now, but. Fred, I know that with some of your work, you very much rely on sort of the wonder of the kiln to see sort of what happens in, in the firing process. But then there's other pieces that you do a lot of planning in your decoration and, and come up with some pretty elaborate designs that you you map out and, and yes. come up with. So you're doing a little bit of both, is, is that right? Well, even in that planning, like in that, that painted, the decorated work or the painted work, um, I mean, there's planning as you're doing it. 
but I don't really, a lot of times when I sit down with, when I sit down with the piece, I mean, here's, here's an example. When I sit down with this piece, uh, uh, I, I don't know, you know, I might know that I'm gonna do this head right here. Like, um, you know, I have that as an idea, but then all this other business, how to resolve all of this, that, that just unfolds as I do it. Like it's, the work is speak, speaks back to you in a way. It's, it's, uh, the, it's like the work says, do this to me, do this to me. Why don't you try this? And I always do. So whatever, whatever the suggestion seems to be, then, you know, I'll go with it. Now I knew on this, this is like a swallow, but this comes, this inspiration is from an old Minoan pot from Greece. And so, uh, but even as I begin to do the layout, you know, I don't know how I'm going to resolve all these little issues, you know, but as I do it, it's the work tells me what to do. It's, um, so, and then there's, you know, like this little, this could be like, it's the handle, but it could be some kind of, sometimes I make it like a snake. Sometimes I make it like a little face. Um, so there's planning as you, as I go, where when you're glazing, you know, I mean, there's just, you know, all this random voids. Now, Carol could take advantage of this, but I didn't give her this one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when, you, when you turn your back. <laughs> so, you know, I like to melt stuff, you know, I like to melt glaze, but then I love to draw. And, uh, there was a period where all I wanted to do was throw. I didn't want to do anything else. Just throw, throw, throw. But then, but then there came a period, um, you know, you have to learn to glaze. And then I saw this famous, it's an octopus pot from, it's a Minoan, it's real famous. It's in a lot of, all, a lot of history books, but it's a big bulbous jar and it has the octopus and its tentacles envelop the whole jug. And when I saw that pot, my heart just started beating. I was like, oh my gosh, man, I wish I could paint like that. And then I decided, well, I'm gonna learn how to paint like that. So then I just, you know, in the beginning, I, I would like copy uh, a historical pot as close as I could. And then, as, you know, and then as time goes on, you, you start to tweak it a little bit more this way or that way. But initially, you know, I would try to, work off of classical designs and then at the same time you know you when you go to art school they don't want you just to be a copyist you know they want you to um you know celebrate your mind your creativity and uh so that you know that just works it's worked its way in with time and you know and just doing so um i think you know there's a saying there's the conscious uh incompetence that's terrible. But then there's conscious, unconscious incompetence is not good, but conscious incompetence is good because now you know that you're not good. And then there's conscious competent, competent, I'm gonna get, get straight here, <laughs> conscious competence. And then there's subconscious competence. And that's where you wanna be, right? Subconsciously, you're competent. So, but acknowledging in the beginning that you don't really know is a big, you know, that's the, that's the first step in, in learning anything. So, um, you know, the more you do something, the more, you know, you begin to understand it and, and that sense of flow. And I think it's a kind of a concentration is what it really amounts to. It's when all the, you know, noise sort of goes away and, it's, and you just have a sort of hyper-focusedness is, um, you know, you're in the groove. And um, so musicians, writers, I guess, artists, any, um, you, know, you just yeah. have to keep doing it. Th thanks, um, Janet Levy just posted in the chat for everyone a link to where you can see an image of the octopus pot that Fred was just talking about. So thank you, Janet. Yeah, it's, it's a great pot. So uh, what else is new that, that you've been working on? Any, anything that you've been experimenting with lately? Well, here's my, here's my latest experimentation. <laughs> uh, you see this? Oh, wow. So, you know, I'm, 
now the, the the trick to this pot is how do you glaze it you know how would you decorate it <laughs> but uh so i i was looking i, I love this one artist uh he's a japanese artist he was his name is rosanjin and rosanjin was like a calligrapher like an epicurean genius and a potter uh and he he kind of played with some baskets where he cut away and so i was looking at some of those pots and then I just decided to play, you know, with this myself. And so I made the one, the first one just had a tight, you know, ring around, but this one, as you see, I let the, I let the, let it flow past the realm. So this is like maybe my most evolved piece. And then you can play it with this geometry in all kinds of ways. And there's all kinds of potters right now across the United States doing all this kind of cut out business. So, I mean, this isn't anything I invented. This is just my, you know, my concept. Uh, but, you know, it's fun to do something new. It's fun to have, you know, something that you haven't done before. It's like keeps things, I mean, that's trout fishing with, with pottery, with food. Um, you know, we, we both get, or easy, we get bored easily. So we like, we, you know, we follow our curiosities and we try lots of different things. If we get an idea, we just try it. We don't worry about whether it's a good idea or a bad idea or if anyone's going to like it or not like it. We just, we just do it and, and, and we I, decide whether we like it. Or not. And I'm, I'm working on some carving now. So this, this piece is uh, ready to be fired. It hasn't been um, fired yet. So these are under glazes. But uh, like Fred said, I'm, I'm going to try this because I had this idea in my mind and it's almost like using the decals except that I'm carving images in into the surface so you'll see a bird. This is a dodo bird, but I tried to use imagery from Mauritius where the dodo bird was from originally. Um, so yeah, it's just something fun. Um, I can't wait to see how this comes out. The great thing about working in, in these glazes, you can refire if you don't like something, you can touch it up and go back. Yeah, it's fun to walk over to Carol's side. I walk over there a few times a day. Her, her side of the, she has her side of the studio, then I have my side. But um, I'm always amazed at what she comes up with. And um, I don't know, it's fun, you know, we have a good life. <laughs> I got a question. Um... On Instagram, you talk a lot about wild clay. Can you tell us why you like it and where you get it? Yes, yeah, so um, we have we have two clay deposits on the land that we live on. And I lived here for a few years <clears throat> before uh, someone told me that our house is like 115 years old. So guys said, yeah, my grandfather would let potters uh, with horse and wagon go behind your house and dig clay along that little creek somewhere. And I said, well, where is it? He said, I can't remember. But if you go back there and look around, you'll find it. So I, so I did. And um, I'm friends with the ceramic engineer from the brick industry. And he came back there and looked. They said, oh, yeah, that's a volcanic ash deposit, primary, you know, um, like K, it's a primary kaolin. Um, and then the red clay that's further up when we dug our basement for our studio, we have a red clay. And that is a decomposed slate. And if you dig down 50 feet, he told me, you're gonna hit a blue rock. But the red clay is the decomposed blue rock. So when we dug our well, when the guy was digging the well, he dug down about 50, 60 feet and the drill started kicking up blue rocks. So he was right on the money as far as all of that goes. But the reason I used the wild clay was because uh, we were getting a fire clay and some other clays at Ohio, Ohio in the Midwest, and they had a lime deposit, which was just a little speck of lime as big as a pinhead, and that thing would expand 100 times its size when it was hydrated, so that can happen just through humidity. So you make the piece, you biscuit, and then it might it might blow a hole out that big around or it might sit around for a few days and blow a hole out like that big or this big. And if you're painting pots like I am and you spend a whole day work painting on the thing, it's not, you know, you can't take too much of that. So 
my one buddy, David Stumpley, said, well, Fred, you should start using wild clay. We don't have lime deposits in our clay here in North Carolina. And I said, well, I'd have to redo all my recipes. He said, so what? You know, just do it. You'll be, you'll, you'll be done with it. So that was the motivation. And then um, after that, you know, it became kind of like, kind of like trout fishing. You, it's a good, good reason to get out in the woods and scratch around. And so my engineering friend, he'll call me sometimes and he'll have some maps and he's looking at different stuff. He's like, let's go, let's go clay scouting, you know, and I always say yes. And um, he's afraid ticks are going to get on him. So <laughs> when we're done, I, I, I check him down for it's ticks. It's a real possibility. <laughs> but um, it's better to go in the winter, you know, scratching around out in the bushes and woods. But uh so, I'll go anytime. so when you dig the, the wild clay, do you work with it as is with all the impurities or do you let it dry out and sift it out and then rehydrate? You know, it? I, I do both. I, um, when I'm throwing with it, I'll take the raw chunks. I'll let it, I'll just sit it out in the sun, let it dry. And then if you don't let it dry, it won't dissolve. But if you let it dry good, then when you drop it in water, it'll just fall apart. But if I drop it in there kind of wet or damp, it won't fall apart. So that's the key for me. And what I do, I wave my different clays out that I want. Um, and then I'll add a lot of water to it. And then I'll make it so thin that the rocks and the gravel will fall out of the clay by gravity because there's so much water. And then if you wait overnight, the water will come to the surface of your bucket or barrel or whatever your, whatever the container is. And then in the bottom will be the sand and the rocks. So the clay's in the middle. So you take the water off and now you have this slurry. You could then pour it out on a plaster table. Um, some people just use a, like a wire with a cloth. Um, I have a filter press uh, that I run it through, uh, but I also have a plaster table. And so that's, that's another way you can work with it. Now, I started doing these wild clay paintings because I'm so moved by this material when I'm digging it out of the ground, just looking at it, it's like, it's so beautiful. I don't even want to mess with it. I don't want to, I want to work with it just the way it is. So I will dig the clay and sometimes I even try to slice it, a chunk, I'll you know, like kind of get it wet and slice it and then work with it like that. But more often than not, I, I still have to mix it. But when I do, I leave the rocks, I leave the roots in it, I leave grass in it, like little roots and stuff. I leave all that in. And I barely touch it as far as the processing would go. I call it minimal processing. And I'm really trying to um, get the clay to, to be in its most like wild state. And I was thinking of like cave paintings. Um, and I wanted to kind of emulate cave paintings. So if you notice in the cave, often in these cave paintings, they'll use the bulge of the rock to be like the, the shoulder or the hip of the bull, but not just painting on a flat surface. So I take these clay slabs and I push them up in different places with the idea that that could be, you know, an animal or uh, some, something, something of that nature. Um, but you can see where the roots were. You can now leave like a big piece of flint rock. I just leave it right in there. I, I think it looks, you know, looks interesting. So anyway, um, you know, it's that handling or processing it or trying to hardly barely process it. It gives a totally different look. And I imagine there's some challenges if you don't really know what the content of that clay is about figuring out how to fire it and get it to temperature so it vitrifies, yes. not having it overheat. Is that just a trial and error process? Well, what I like to do is make these little whis little whiskey cups or tea. You know, some people might drink tea out of it, but I, <laughs> I like to drink tequila and uh, single malt myself. But this right, this piece. This is 100% straight out of the ground, no glaze. And I call this clay magic butter fat because it throws like magic and feels like butter. Now, if it melted, which I have some, I should have brought them. I have some that 
this whole thing just like sunk. It just melted right down, you know, to um, kind of like a little blob. Now that clay had too much iron in it. So this is a, this is a kaolin. It was almost, it wasn't white, but it was kind of like cream and, and a little bit of reddish iron smidge in there. Uh, but uh, like some of the red, red clays that we dig, like on the, our land, it has silica in it. So it has so much silica that it makes it refractory. But if you took the silica out of it, it would just melt. So uh, Ben had some clay on his mother's land and I dug a batch of it. We dug it together, but some of it had more red and some of it had a little more white or cream. Well, the first batch I mixed had more cream. It was refractory. The second batch I mixed, it was more red. So we fired his kiln for four days and I made birds and bowls and every single one of them just melted down like, you know, a blob. So anyway, luckily it only got on my pots and it didn't get on anyone else's pots, but sometimes it just doesn't work out, but it's trial and error. And a, and a tea bowl is a, or a whiskey cup is a, is a, you don't have a big investment of time and you get to see how it throws. You get to see how it feels and you get to see how it fires. So here's, uh, here's one with the burnt rice husk on it. See that little frog, but it'll do, you know. Anyway, this is another example, just the variety of surfaces. It's on that one. Ooh. <laughs> this one is yeah. just a Shino, like this is the Shino with the chimney, this is where the chimney side was. And then this was the firebox side. The flame was hitting it directly. You can see where the salt got it there, but on the back side, it was protected. So it's very directional. So that's, that's how I test the wild clays. And then, then I'll scale it up. You know, I'll go with something bigger once I have confidence that of how it performs. Then I'll, you know, and we often mix the clays with different, with other clays. Like rarely do you find a single clay that will work by itself. But I do have a clay that comes from the Catawba Valley that you can throw it at 100% right out of the ground, right off the pile. I could just grab it. It's so, it's so amazing. I can just grab it right off the pile, wedge it on the table a few times and take it to the wheel and throw something out of it. So, but that's, that's more of a rarefied thing. It's often you're blending, like the clay on our land is so sandy. I can use it by itself, but it's better if I mix some other clays with it. It'll, it'll work, like if I mix that butter fat with it, it'll, it'll work really good, you know, but either one by themselves, it, they have issues. Right. So y'all are not from, originally from the Seagrove area, I don't think, but what, what brought you to, to Seagrove and led you to settle there? And, and what's it like being there as part of the, how important is that community of potters that you live amongst? Well, I brought Carol to Seagrove. Um, Has she, she forgiven she started, you yet? She started crying. Yeah, she started crying. <laughs> yeah, she started bawling like a baby. Well, and, I, had uh, I had lived in New York City and Washington, D.C. and I got kind of used to conveniences so to speak. But, um, but now, she, I, you know, but I knew everyone here because I had worked here and lived here before I went off to Alfred. So I knew the community very well. And she, you know, she had instant friends and, you know, dinner parties every night. And we have every a lot night. of, dinner, yeah, we have a lot of dinner parties in Seagrove because there's no good restaurants. <laughs> so you have to. Yeah, a lot of like potlucks too. A lot of potlucks. But um, the way I found out about Seagrove is, when I first began, um, I, I bought a house and had like a, it was like an 80 year old house and had a detached spring kitchen. So I bought a wheel and got a little electric kiln. I just started playing. And I was down visiting my family in Graham, North Carolina. And my uncle said, well, you should, I told him what I was doing. I was, I got a potter's wheel and I was messing around. He said, we well, should go to Sanford, meet the Cole sisters. 
And when my uncle, my uncle was a uh, Presbyterian minister, when he got out of seminary, his first church was in Broadway there near Sanford. And he knew A.R. Cole, ne Neola, and Celia Cole, and uh, their brother G.F. And so I met them, and they're 10th generation, 9th generation potters, and they were originally from Seagrove. So Neola told me, she said, Fred, you have to go to Seagrove. So I came over here and there was probably, I don't know, I'm gonna think, I'm thinking maybe, maybe 15 to 20 potters were working and still a lot of the old potters were working. Um, and I, I was, I thought I'd found Mecca. I was like so excited that I found a place where I could learn, uh, I could learn more. So I wasn't a very good potter uh, at all. I was just an amateur at, at best. And, but I was determined to try to get a job. So I worked for Ben Owens' father. And the first day he said, well, I'll try you out. First day I made like a little marmalade jar. And the second half of the day I cut and stacked wood for the wood kiln. And at the end of the day, he said, well, you're not a very good potter yet, but you're a good worker. I'll keep you around. So I went around and I did that with about half a dozen potters. So, you know, I had a full-time job, but I was working for different people. And, um, and I learned, you know, I mean, my skill levels just increased, you know, very quickly when I, you know, spending eight hours a day at the wheel. And uh, so um, that's how, and, and then as far as the community goes now, it's very important to us because, I mean, we collaborate in so many different ways. I mean, we're in competition with one another, but we're also in collaboration with one another. So I just finished firing uh, with Ben Owen and for his big wood kiln. It took like, uh, we fired for four days. And then David Stumpfler, he's another pot friend of mine, we used to fire, fire for five days. So they need an, a, uh, an experienced team of people. And, you know, I've been doing this, firing with them for 20, 25, more than 25 years now. So we have, we, we know what to expect from each other. And we also share a lot of, um, I'm not going to give you my best glaze, but you know, if you had if you had a problem with a glaze, I would help you. I would help a fellow potter out, try to figure it out. Like Bruce Golson, he's a he's really good with glazes. Um, ben, you know, he's he's good at a lot of different things, but um, he'll probably come over and help me build this new wood kiln that I'm working on. Um, so we. And we trade a lot of information and, uh, and we organize together. We have the Seagrove Potters uh, you know, organization. We have this, our wood firing group. Um, and we just finished making a presentation at Inseca. It was Hitomi, uh, Shibata, and Ben, and David Stumpfley, and myself. Um, so, and if you need like, you know, like you want to borrow uh, uh, some sugar or milk from your neighbor, I can like borrow some Phelps bar or a cup, cobalt, of, zinc. cup yeah. of zinc from my neighbor, you know, so it's, <laughs> it's convenient. This is probably a good time to put in a plug that uh, this weekend, the Seagrove Area Potters Association is sponsoring their sort of weekend kiln opening studio tour. It's going on what, Friday, Saturday? Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, lots of area potteries are open and have special, you know, they've just finished firing and have a lot of inventory. If you're not familiar with the area and need some advice on where to go, I believe they're going to have, um, when you get to Seagrove, uh, right on Highway, is it 701? That, um, 705. 705 is the, yeah, 705, the, the Lux pottery theme. highway and uh, the Lux cannery is there and the Potters Association is going to have a tent and table there with people with maps and, and helping you with directions if, if you're interested in going to Seagrove and just need some help figuring out how to navigate around. So yeah, yeah the Potters have been busy all winter and making and so there'll be lots of new things to see, things that, you know, never been seen before so today uh when we get done here i go over to ben's and we unload the wood kiln so it'll be uh hopefully good good results hopefully not a lot of puddles of melted no <laughs> don't say it not too many experiments yeah all right
Uh, any other questions from the audience? If, if you want to take yourself off mute and pose a question or put something in the chat, we've got a moment. I think as we get to the close, we're going to try, um, a friend and Carol are going to walk over to their studio, which is next door to their home. Um, and we're use a, an iPhone to let everybody see their, their studio a little bit. Um, be, because Vince, I, I, Vince. Yes. I just like, I just want to show you he this one. Show I, just, I just want to show you this one thing you said about the pandemic. How has it influenced you? So this is, as you see, it's a trout. You see that fly, right? <laughs> so this is uh, this is what the pandemic did for me. Boy, so then I had to jump in because he was having so much fun. I started making decals that look like flies. Which one? Where, where is it? Well, right there. there yeah, there you go. See, I took, uh, I took, yeah, because I thought, well, it looks kind of looks like fun what he's doing. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So I just that's, to put that in that's fun to see, you know, as I see you show these pieces, you both got this sort of whimsical approach of fitting in little, little like your handle with the fish or, you know, the decorations. I, I don't know if you both always had that same kind of um, whimsy built in or whether you've influenced each other over time. I think, I think Carol's influenced me. She's yeah. given me permission to be, to you know, be, to be, to be more fun. Yeah, be more fun. fun. Yeah. yeah. To yeah. play. Yeah. I definitely see a lot more of that than I, than I remember in the past. So. Yeah, yeah. I but think, and, you know, and more and more, we, maybe we do it even, we mm -hmm. egg each other on, you know, oh, maybe, yeah, that's she true. eggs me on more. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think the other thing is as you, as you age, um, maybe you're more, uh, you, you're more yourself, right? You're more, um, yeah. And so, uh, and, you, or not. and you do maybe, you know, like we'd say about my grandmother, her, she doesn't have her filter going on anymore, you know? So maybe even, you know, artistically, you take your filter off, you know, and you just let it, just let it all, just do whatever. And where before like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that or no, no. Now it's, I must always listen to my instincts you know? <clears throat> because I think instincts are a different type of intelligence. Uh, your sub, you know, what is visceral, um, you know, it's, it's based on, Maybe you know it's it's maybe it's like a subconscious some subconscious um, confidence confidence confidence, confidence or you know in, in, <laughs> insights. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Do you want me to try and um, get in and see if we? I mean, start up. Yeah. Let's see if we can take this across and so they can see the studio. Yeah, I think people would enjoy that if it if we can make it work. And um, okay, I'll I'll try and do it right now, and then um, yeah. So I I I built the studio uh, maybe six years ago, and I did it in in part in like a Greek revival style. Carol has Greek heritage; both mother and father are are Greek. So anyway, it was kind of homage. The entrance of the building um, is done in this Greek revival Ionic columns. Um, and anyway, my building experience came in good. All right, I guess we'll walk. <laughs> All right, the, the, it's not a long walk, so uh, everyone just bear with us a moment. Um, we're to speak. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. We... All right, but you don't see anything yet, all right? Oh, wait, there I am. Okay, I'm trying to switch it so I can... Uh, there we go, here. We've, we've got uh, sound and picture now. Okay, here we go. That's what, this is what I was trying to get. So you could see as we're coming out, this is our studio, yeah. Here, Fred, you want to, you're better at this camera thing than I am. I'll go open up. You can call. 
we have like a cupola where we go up there and watch the sunset and uh, have a drink after work. Nice. For anybody that does make it to and here's the. the Our <laughs> uh, this is great to be able to see a few more pieces of your work. Um, spin that around, Carol. Sure. Slower. Keep going. So this piece is maybe, I don't know, 75. 80 pounds of clay. Wow. Uh, okay. Here's some more glazed business. I love this piece of Carol's. It's been, this is a, uh, they call Indian it uh, in the Indian, the Indian runner. They're ducks kind of go up. All right. Keep going. All right. Mm -hmm. Can you show more studio space? I'll take you to the studio, Carol side of the studio now. Uh, Alamander. We we're talking about those cave paintings. So that's one of my one of my clay paintings. Now we're in the Carol side. And this piece she's working on right here. Turn that around, Carol. It's in our process right now. This one's like still. It's a wallaby, uh, Australian kangaroo. So all the imagery pertains to Australia. Okay, that's good stuff from the. See these two fish on the top of its head. <laughs> and the alligator is his tail. And I, I told Carol, this alligator has got him right by the, you know what? But that's really his tail. Yeah, it's kind of fun. And then uh, working on some presidential heads. There's Abraham Lincoln. Grant. Grant. Uh, here's uh, Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. Here's another uh, bird here. Look at a lot of details. This a commission. Oops. You can see all the little detail. I love this little cat that's in there. I love it. All right, we'll walk over to my side. Here's Carol keeps her books and stuff. Wish you can. So I have some, here's some of my chunks of clay. This is, a, you can see the layers in this piece of clay. That's the, volcanic ashes in the water. There was an ancient sea here and this air was volcanic. So these are all the layers of volcanic ash. And then here's some other clays. This comes from Rockingham, North Carolina. And then here's a piece of the, uh, the butter fat. It's really beautiful. And then uh, here's one of my tiles. She's, uh, it's like the disco era. 
platform shoes, uh, bell bottom pants, hip hookers, tube tops. You know, that's a 70s thing. There's all kind of interesting things in the studio. How about your antlers? This is all shoe, shoe horn. That's bull kelp from uh, Tasmania. We did a, we did some teaching in Tasmania and Australia. So anyway, I always bring back some kind of thing. But, uh, oh, here's some more. You can see some of this glaze. I think everybody can get a good idea of what a beautiful workspace they have and uh, it's a it's a just a beautiful sunny place to to stop in if you do make it to Seagrove you won't yeah you won't. Like that. yeah we'd love we'd love for you to come visit us we're we're one mile south of Seagrove we have a beautiful deck you can come out and sit look around and uh we're here most of the time but if you're driving from any long distance you should Give us a call just to make sure I haven't gone trout fishing. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we uh, looks like I oh, decline it. Just decline. It's a it's a phone call. There we go. Uh, excuse me. All right. Um, but yes, please come out this weekend. The potters have been busy, and there's all kinds of new things to see. Well, we um, um, our our crowd has been shy with questions. Uh, we'll have one last moment, um, but we certainly appreciate you taking the time to talk with us this morning. It's been a real treat. Um, great to well, thank, see all this work. And thank you for having us. We yeah, really thank you. we really enjoy it. Enjoyed it, and we really appreciate every appreciate everyone uh, coming to coming to listen. So. We'd love to have you visit Secret. Wonderful. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thanks to all of our so guests you. for joining us today. Um, again, the video will be posted uh, roughly by this time tomorrow. And uh, we hope you'll join us again next Thursday when we do a similar session with Akira Sataki up in the uh, Asheville area. So thank you for being here today. And uh, Thanks to, to both Fred and Carol. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Bye bye. 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 I think we're all. <laughs>